I decided to try something a bit different and put together a list of my top tips and advice for Storm King's Thunder. This will not be replacing my ongoing series where I talk about how I ran Storm Kings, rather this is a boiled down quick and easy way for me to let my dear viewers know about some of the most important things I learned by running the campaign. So without further ado, let's jump into the top 10 tips that I can offer on running Storm King's Thunder. The first chapter of Storm King's Thunder brings up six factions that hold power in the north and who are involved with or affected by the events of the campaign. Five of those factions are open for membership to players in the Adventure League, and I highly recommend that you not only allow your players to join one of them, but also that you encourage it. Not only does membership in one of these groups potentially change interactions with key NPCs throughout the campaign, and offer additional quests and rewards, but also being a member in one of these groups gives your players a network of contacts throughout the North that can potentially offer invaluable information. My players came to rely heavily on their membership in the Harpers, and when they found themselves lost or unable to progress with the story, I could offer them key information and help the other allies in that faction. So having your player characters be a part of one or more organizations is not only a safety net for them, but it's a tool for you to guide them along the story and to reveal important information when it's most needed. I know this might sound incredibly obvious, but I still want to give it a mention. Read up on giants. There's a lot of useful information both in the monster manual and in the giant chapter of Volos Get Monsters, and I recommend that you read through them both a few times. Your players are going to be spending a heck of a lot of time interacting with giants, trying to figure out the motivation of giants and researching giants, so you need to know what they're like. Each type of giant has their own kind of behavior, gods and culture, and if you want to portray them accurately, it is important that you as a DM understand them. It is especially important to understand the giant concepts of Mott and Mog, and to understand how each giant race views the Ordning and determine their place within it. True, the Ordning has been broken, but it is important to remember that giant kind has relied on the Ordning since the dawn of time to determine their place in the universe. Even though the different types of giants now fight to determine their place in a new warning, they still cling to old titles and positions that were determined while the Ordning reigned. It is hard to overcome a behavior so deeply ingrained in a people, and so many giants will judge others based on the criteria that the Ordning has taught them to value. It is also important to understand the gods of the giants. Depending on how you run your game, they may not have any direct interaction with the campaign. But the giants are doing what they're doing in an effort to impress their gods, so as a DM it can be important to know what those gods are like. Storm King's Founder is all about highlighting giants, allowing your players to explore their culture and history when they aren't experiencing the business end of a giant club or boulder that is. As such, it's important to give your players a chance to learn more about giants. Also, there is a lot of information in the adventure that is very hard to come by, except directly from the giants. As such, try to make sure that your players have ample opportunities to interact with giants and talk to them. There is no need for every encounter with giants to end in bloodshed, unless your players push for it. Most giants won't see a group of small folk as much of a threat, and that overconfidence can be an opening for the players to use. Some of the best interactions that I had while running Storm King's Thunder came from uh, my players discussing the Ordning with different giants, or spying on giants interacting amongst themselves. One of the complaints my players had about Storm King's Thunder was that a lot of the bad guys appeared out of nowhere without any build-up. And that was with me trying to provide a little bit of foreshadowing. As such, I highly recommend putting some work into foreshadowing. Imrif is one of the most powerful ancient dragons of the north, and as such she is known to several scholars and students of history. Slerkefel is widely worshipped across the trackless sea, and although his Kraken society is a clandestine organization, they have been operating along the Sword Coast for generations, and as such should at least be known by other secret societies such as the Harpers, who they have no doubt come into conflict with in the past. Harshnag is a hero of great renown, both he and Fort Grey are likely mentioned in songs and tales around the Sword Coast, and as he makes his way across the land he is sure to leave a trail of new stories as he helps out locals or vanquishes evil giants or dangerous beasts. The different giant lords may not be known by many small folk, but their names should be fairly common knowledge amongst their own kin. Try to sprinkle in little hints about the big players ahead of time. 
In my playthrough, for instance, the players found a book that described several of the chromatic dragons that live in the north, and I let them hear some rumors about a frost giant that had saved a group of villagers from bandits. Small things such as those can go a long way. Imidith is an ancient blue dragon. She is a powerful magic user, a shapeshifter, and a master manipulator. As such, she has quite the reputation. She's also a known foe of giant kind and the mastermind behind what's going on in Storm King's Thunder and has infiltrated the court of the Storm Giants. Yet for some inexplicable reason, she has decided to use her real name when posing as a Storm Giant while trying to infiltrate the High King's court. And it never really made any sense to me and neither to my players. Yes, they should have a chance to figure out the true identity of Imrif, but there are better ways to reveal her. I suggest giving Imrif a pseudonym, as it seems unlikely that no storm giant would ever have heard of her before. As for giving hints of her true nature, Imrif may have already assumed storm giant form when the players see her at the Eye of the Allfather, or if you want to go get more subtle, the players could spot that the weapon of Strongmouth seems to be free of ice, as it was recently interacted with, and the party might spot giant tracks leading up to it. They could perhaps even see dragon footprints that suddenly turn into giant ones in the frost. Storm King Thunder gives a pretty good overview of the north, but one book could not nearly cover everything you would need to know to portray the region. I suggest looking into some additional sources to flesh out the area of the, the campaign is set in. The Sword Coast Adventures Guide is a good start. It is the most up-to-date source, source of information, but like SDK, it offers more of a wide overview rather than an in-detail look of, on the region. I use several other sources from previous editions for a more detailed look into locations that my players found themselves in. Don't be afraid to use sources from an older edition. In most cases, your players won't know that a certain store or NPC is taken from a hundred years ago. As long as an older source doesn't contradict a newer one, then go for it. I used the... Uh, the North Guide to the Savage Frontier and Volo's Guide to the North from 2nd edition to expand on most of the locations in the adventure, especially the different towns. For Waterdeep I used the City of Splendor as my main reference material, and then for Neverwinter I used the Neverwinter Campaign Guide from 4th edition to provide some extra insight. I can also highly recommend giving the uh, Legacy of a Crystal Shard Adventure a look for, a more, for more information on Icewind Dale. Chances are your party are going to be doing a lot of traveling and exploring, and often you may not know as a DM what their next move will be. As such, you will find random encounters to be your friends. There is a decent amount of them in the book, although I found myself running out of new encounters about halfway through the campaign. But what I did, and I highly recommend you doing, is to weave the random encounters into the story and to let them help you tell the tale of SDK and to work, uh, and to work off each other. Always ask yourself why that particular group of monsters or travelers are there and how their presence affects the story at large. Let me give you some examples. Not too far away from Fireshear, my party encountered the Knight Jord of Tavelson, who had lost his squire to Frost Giants. To place him into the larger events unfolding, I decided that he was traveling to Fireshear and that the Frost Giants he had met were not just rampaging along the countryside, but had been sent to scout Fireshear before the attack that would soon come to the town. The party helped the knight to get his revenge and then headed south, leaving him to travel to Fireshare on his own. Had they later gone to a village, then they would have found that the attack had already happened, and Jordith would have led the defense of the town, eventually falling back into the mines and becoming trapped. As such, the players wouldn't encounter him again unless they let him out. A NPC that became a recurring character, however, was the uh, halfling ranger Vordana Jesral. My players found her on the way to Luskin and traveled with her until they arrived in town, where she showed them the best inn to rest her weary heads at. She was traveling east, towards Everland, and so, if my players visited a location where it made sense for her to be in her travels, or they encountered a random ranger encounter along the, her travel path, they would once more bump into their friend Vordana. I tried to do this for each random encounter I rolled, keeping track of where they were going and what effects they would have. So if my players avoided a group of giants, they might hear later about raids by those same giants, or encounter them as they return from their destination. By doing this, I managed to make my world feel more alive to my players. 
The Whims of the North was a series of articles in Dragon Magazine that described in detail the different ancient dragons living in the North, their territories, powers, agendas and personalities. While doing some research I managed to stumble across these articles online and I have to say they were some of the best research material I found. Not only did they help me flesh out and understand Imrif and Klauf, who are vital to the story, but they gave me a look into the rest of the dragons of the North and allowed me to seed red herrings about the other dragons operating across the region. This allowed me to foreshadow Imrif and Klauf without revealing that they were behind anything going on. I highly recommend using the information provided to expand on the fight against Imrif and her abilities. I converted over her signature spells and allowed her to harass the players as they approached her lair with her stone avatars. I can say it truly terrifies a wizard player when the villain casts a spell that literally burns their spell slots out of their blood. I will add a link to the articles in the description below, and I highly recommend that you read through them. Giants are extremely powerful mythical creatures, and as such should never come off as weak or easy to defeat. They need to be portrayed as a solid threat towards the north, and as such you should not be afraid to let your players fail against them. The first time your players come face to face with a giant, they should be afraid. And as a DM you should highlight the near unstoppable might of a giant. Don't sabotage your players, but make them work for victory. It's important to set the tone. Later on, as your players start going up against giant lords, it's even more important that the group works together, using all of her guile and powers to overcome the giants. And don't let the giants just take punishment from your players without reacting. These are, for the most part, extremely talent talented and intelligent individuals, often with decades of experience behind them. If the giant lords start losing, let them adapt, pull out every trick you can to keep them alive. Each time my players retreated from a giant stronghold, I would look over what spells and abilities they had and start to shore up their defenses. Let the giants set up traps and barricades, have them summon elementals, and if reinforcements arrive, then have those extra troops stick around to fortify the location. My players eventually became so powerful that they could sometimes battle a dozen giants and win. And yet, every now and then, the giants would show them that they were still a power to fear, setting up devastating ambushes or by just sheer ferocity and numbers. Also, never forget that a defeat doesn't have to be the end. Many of the giant lords would much prefer to take the players alive and then, than to brutally murder them, and organizing a jailbreak from the ranks of fire giant slaves, or fighting your way out of Chief Gus's kitchen covered in egg and batter can be a uniquely entertaining experience in its own right. So, you have been playing for a little over a year, the Ording has been restored, the North is safe once more, and there are no more giant lords to slay. So what happens now? What are you to do if you want to continue the story of your giant slaying group? Well, there just ha happens to be an adventure that you can follow up Storm King's Thunder with that fits both theme-wise and level-wise, against the giants, and it can be found in Tales from a Yawning Portal. I suggest giving your PCs a little bit of downtime after the events of SDK and then jump into Against the Giants. Now the adventures in Tales from the Yawning Portal aren't really adventures, they're more like some of the more famous dungeons from previous editions of D&D. So they're easy to throw into any campaign, but they also require a bit of extra work to make them feel as detailed as some of the previous locations your players might have visited. Luckily, if you want more information on the adventure, this particular gem has been re-released several times over the years, and so when it came for time for me to run it, I borrowed my brother's anniversary copy of the original adventure and read it through. I also read through the 4th edition versions post posted in the Dungeon Magazine back in the day. Most I did this for some additional names and insight into the motivation of some of the parties involved in the adventure. And after many hours of research, I still cannot say how or why the Fire Giant King managed to trap an Imperion in his basement. I suggest customizing the adventure depending on how the Storm King's Thunder ended for your group. As an example, in my run through SDK, my players were widely known as the Defenders of Icewind Dale and had made some friends there. So I let the place being attacked by the giants be Icewind Dale, and I had them summon back, uh, have them summon back their champions to fight against this new threat. If your group is based out of Neverwinter or frequented Tribor, then those could be places in danger instead. That's all the advice I have for this time. Let me know what you have thought of in the comments below, and as always, if you enjoyed my video, then please like it down below. And if you want to see more videos about D&D in the future, you can subscribe. 
If you want to support the channel, then share this video with your friends or on social media. And you can also check out my DMs Guild products. Links to all of that in the description below. Until next time, Dungeon Delvers.